This is O'Brien's Law, a romantic thriller by John McNellis. Narrated by David Davino. Prologue. Tell me again, Inspector Cleary said, glancing up from the scribbles on his notepad, starting with when you got the call. I was, I was asleep at home. The phone rang about 1 a.m. It was my night guy, replied Davenport, the hotel's general manager. The 50-ish executive was exhausted. His eyes bagged crescent moons. He dug into his suit jacket for his beloved cigarettes, but he was too rattled, his hands too tremulous to light a match. He told me Mr. Knox was dead. No, take me through it step by step, the inspector said, lighting the cigarette for him. Holding the spent match, he scanned the presidential suite for a waste basket. The penthouse overflowed with silk screens and vases, an ornate throne, suits of samurai armor, a wall of bejeweled swords, carved ivory collections, and framed photographs of Malcolm Knox posing with world leaders from Sir Winston Churchill to the Shah of Iran. As exquisite as Knox's museum quality possessions were, the inspector was more impressed with the suite's views of Knob Hill and the Golden Gate Bridge. Leaning against a round stone table that sat twelve, he eyed the manager. But that's the first thing Gates said. Davenport glanced up wiping his brow, wondering if the tight-lipped policeman doubted his story. He said Malcolm Knox was dead, that he had drowned in his bathtub. The tub was jammed with a washcloth and hadn't been overflowing. What a mess, until 1302 called to complain about the water dripping from their ceiling. What time did he say that was? I didn't ask. You should talk to him, Davenport said. He dreaded the prospect of a police investigation dragging his hotel into the papers. The El Cortez's allure lay in its privacy. I'm talking to you, the inspector snapped, turning up the heat. He drew himself erect and sidled over to his quarry. He'd had a career's worth of chipping away at stonewalling witnesses. Cleary's trim physique and carriage suggested he was younger than his middle age. Yet, after twenty years of investigating mankind at its worst, his face was lined, his hairline in retreat, his fingernails bitten to the quick. Gates must have gotten the complaint a while before he called you. A half hour? An hour? Probably. He had to find the building engineer first. That must have taken a few minutes. Then the engineer came up, knocked. There was no answer, of course. He tried the lock and... That's what Gates told you? The doors were locked? The inspector asked, pointing across the room to the lacquered ebony double doors. We've been through all this. That's the only way in and out? except for the glass doors leading out to the deck, Davenport said. What about those? I already told you, Gates said the deck was locked from the inside. So he called security, our nightman came up, knocked and opened the door with the master key. He found Mr. Knox in the tub, shut off the water, called Gates and Gates called the police. It's that simple. So the chain wasn't latched? No. Old guy like that. How old was he? In his 80s? The inspector asked. 82. You know that off the top of your head? Yes, said Davenport, grinning at the fading memory. Seven years ago, in 1970, he threw himself a wild 75th birthday party. Said he had to kick off the new decade in style since it would likely be his last. Probably only invited me to ensure we wouldn't call the police. A rich geezer with all this valuable stuff? These antiques must be worth a fortune. Doesn't latch the chain at night? Hell, this jade table must cost as much as a house. Cleary rubbed the cool stone, the color of money, wondering how the hell the delivery guys ever got it up to the penthouse. It has to be six inches thick. I believe it may be marble, but yes, point taken, Inspector, Davenport said but you need to appreciate that the El Cortez is probably the safest hotel in San Francisco. We never have theft issues. Our lobby is small and our guest elevators are directly across from the front desk. We know our guests. Most have been coming for years. That's our great advantage. And as I told you, Mr. Knox has, had, been living in this suite for 13 years without a single incident. It's no surprise he hadn't fastened the security chain. But who knows? 
Maybe he latched it every night right before going to bed. Anyone else have a key? Housekeeping and security. What about his staff? Looks like he had a secretary, the inspector said, thumbing at the manuscript stacks on the table, the cluttered desk across the vast living room, a sheet of paper and a Smith Corona typewriter. Like a gentleman's club, the mahogany paneled suite was redolent of cigar smoke and old scotch. Mr. Knox was, how shall I say this, a difficult man. I don't wish to speak ill of the dead, but I doubt anyone ever trusted him, and I'm quite sure he trusted no one. He once told me that gratitude was merely the expectation of future benefits. So? So, I doubt anyone else had a key. As you've pointed out, even the smallest objet d'art in these rooms is priceless. What about these? You know anything about this part of his life? The inspector tapped a pile of photo albums, files and reel-to-reel -reel film cans. One was open, several feet of film hanging out. A glance at the film had confirmed the inspector's hunch. Amateur pornography. You could sell these on Market Street. I understand he had an active social life, that's all. No girlfriend? Ask his associates, or his nephew. We'll get to them. What about this? The inspector asked, ignoring the manager's peek, crossing the room to a floor safe set inside an open closet. Manufactured by the Victor Safe and Lock Company, the blue enameled safe stood about three feet high. Mr. Knox had it installed when he first moved in. Anything in it? I have no idea. I don't know if anyone ever saw it open. As I mentioned, Mr. Knox was not a trusting man. Could be sentimental knickknacks. One man's treasure is another's dross. Some kind of dross, Cleary said, bending, examining the old-fashioned safe. Look, he had it cemented to the floor. Please remember, Mr. Knox trusted no one. How rich was he? No idea. Wealthy enough to afford this suite. That's rich, this penthouse, Cleary said, opening his arms to encompass it, taking in the postcard bridge in the distance, is crazy rich. Inspector Cleary? Yeah? May I ask a simple question? The manager asked, treading lightly, fearing the answer. He slipped off his glasses and wiped them with his handkerchief. I know you have to be thorough, ask all your questions and whatnot, but isn't it clear that Mr. Knox either had a heart attack? You, you must have seen his table of medications, or, or slipped and fell in the shower, and then drowned? The inspector shrugged. If the old man had been penniless, he would have agreed. The poor had accidents. Knowing he needed the manager's cooperation, he decided to keep his thoughts to himself. That could be the case. You've no doubt heard that old expression. When you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. That's a good one. Gotta remember that, the inspector said, grinning without mirth. He jotted a note down in his pad. Zebras. But I guess I'm in the business of cutting the zebras out of the herd. As far as I can tell, the manager pressed, not a single piece of art or antique is missing. I'll get housekeeping to do an inventory in the morning to confirm that every silver spoon is accounted for. Yeah, count the spoons, Cleary said. Certain not a dish towel would be missing. It wasn't spoons that had him questioning the bathtub accident, but the dead man's stunning wealth. Someone was about to inherit a fortune. Chapter One, A Nifty Solution. In 1979, Verdant Jackson Street between Montgomery and Sansom was the loveliest commercial block in San Francisco with its preening two- and three-story neoclassical buildings crowded in on either side, its once moribund warehouses brimming with decorators, antique dealers, and ad agencies. A casual visitor to Tree Line Jackson could browse vendors of silken fabrics, French antiques, and rare books, brushing elbows with button-down iconoclasts who belonged to the best clubs. One could buy an oriental vase that cost more than a car, coffee for 50 cents, or endless hours with fashionable psychiatrists. The Transamerica Pyramid, just five years old, soared a block away, guarding Jackson Square like the Colossus of Rhodes. Mid-block, 
a small plane tree stood outside a red brick warehouse that once stabled the fire department's horses. It now served as the law offices of Drummond, Upton, and Isherwood. While its facade had changed a little in a hundred years, the building was a marvel inside, the heart of architectural fashion, with skylights flooding sunshine throughout its exposed timbers, earthquake bracing and open floors. Visitors on the ground floor could glimpse the sky four stories above. The firm's principal conference room was set in the back right-hand corner of the first floor. The windowless room had two exposed brick walls and a long oak conference table that sat twenty. One early Thursday evening, it hosted a partners' meeting, a dozen men ranging in ages from their early thirties to mid-forties. Their ties were loosened and sleeves rolled up. Between their deep familiarity with one another, the open bar and the platter of chips and guacamole from the Mexican restaurant around the corner, the atmosphere was convivial. Guys, let's wrap this up. Anyone object to our making Turner an offer? If he accepts, that'll bring our class of 79 to 5, okay? Okay, then, let's bring him in. Now, what's next on the agenda? Jack Farwell asked, putting on his reading glasses. The knock's over, Billing, a smart-ass young partner said gleeful. It isn't a case of overbilling. It's a case of a client underpaying, John Buckley said. His attempt at humor greeted with silence. In his early 40s, Buckley had spent his career with a firm and considered himself Drummond's top litigator. Of middling height, he was soft rather than fat, wore gold wire rim glasses, and had lank blonde hair combed forward over a broad forehead. He had developed amnesia about his plebeian background and his first day at Yale, and had considered himself an aristocrat ever since. He had a sharp wit and a serpent's tongue. Few willingly debated with him. This isn't a joke, Farwell said. Everyone's seen Knox's letter. Twenty months have gone by, and you're not a step closer to recovering his uncle's estate. You want to give us your side of it, John? Farwell was the firm's managing partner. Because he was also a certified public accountant, he could actually read a balance sheet. Only forty he disguised his hands' persistent trembling as best he could. Wearing his habitual expression, what the simple would call a smile, Buckley tried to explain how he had billed nearly $100,000 to the Knox matter while accomplishing nothing. He played to the firm's business lawyers, analogizing his time spent to countless hours required in obtaining the permits for a high-rise construction project. The groundwork now laid, he insisted his project, the lawsuit, would go up in a flash. What a load of crap, Greg Gordon said. To pump up your hours, you screwed Knox. Bill the hell out of a loser case, knowing A, he wasn't your client, and B, he was a one-off. That's how you managed to hit your 1,800 billable hours despite your sabbatical in Paris. If I were your lawyer, Greg, I'd advise you never to opine on this subject, Buckley replied, his dolphin smile in place. You spend one hour filling in blanks and loan documents and then bill the poor borrower for eight. That's criminal. If you were my lawyer, I'd have an insanity defense just for hiring you. You're leaving Jack holding the bag on this mess. He'll have to write off your time. Guy, stop. This isn't getting us anywhere, Farwell said, massaging his forehead. He looked down at the table for support for the three partners with power, the lawyers who control the firm's biggest accounts. None met his gaze. Unless we work something out, Knox is going to the state bar with a complaint. We don't need that aggravation. John and I met with him, and we think we might have a plan. Here we go, the smartass interrupted, laughing. Why do I even come to these meetings? The deals are all cut in advance. Here's a proposal, Farwell said. Knox will agree that we don't have to write off the 100000 now. We can keep it on the books and collect it pending a successful outcome. John still thinks we could win if, here's the if, we give Knox a year's worth of free associate time now. So we save John's bacon by screwing some poor associate? Who are you thinking of? A senior partner asked. Wait, wait, don't tell me. The smart ass said, You clever bastards. O'Brien. Yes, that'll put us two up on Knox, Buckley said, chuckling. God damn it, John, knock it off, Farwell said. O'Brien's not that bad, he just lacks focus. He needs some help from you guys. 
And as part of the deal, John has promised to supervise him every step of the way. Poor kid, Gordon said. It's actually a nifty solution, the young partner chimed. We have to write off half of what O'Brien bills already. He doesn't have enough work, and he needs the experience. Let's wrap this up, Farwell said, checking his watch. He just wanted to go home. All in favor? Thanks, guys. I'll talk to O'Brien first thing Monday morning. No rush. He never gets in until 10, Buckley said. You just can't help being a dick, can you? Gordon said, exhaling his 14th Marlboro of the day toward the rafters. He sighed. Always a half step from trouble. Francis Michael O'Brien had just been sold into servitude. Chapter 2 First Punch Across town, the middle school gym in the heart of the Richmond district reeked of sweat the way incense clings to cathedrals. The stucco building was small, with barely enough room to walk around the basketball court. A clutch of secretaries and paralegals stood courtside, talking among themselves but paying little attention to the game, in attendance only to go drinking with the team afterward. The evening lawyers' league game was tied at 30 apiece with two minutes left. Tempers were rising as the aging players, those who'd lost a step and those who never had one, resorted to fouling one another rather than playing defense. The players on the district attorney's team were angry. Come on, guys, suck it up, said Michael O'Brien. He was a ringer on the DA's team, courtesy of Blake Gamble, his law school writing instructor. At 25, O'Brien was the squad's newest member, its leading scorer, and its biggest cheerleader. His mop of curly black hair was tucked beneath his lucky headband, his forearms adorned with decorative wristbands. Despite his height, he played point guard, staying on the perimeter, searching for open shots. Inbounding, Gamble passed the ball to O'Brien, who raced down the court, juked his defender, pulled up 12 feet from the basket, and shot, clanking the ball off the rim. Four players went for the rebound, two grabbing it in a jump ball. Enraged by an elbow to his ribs, a forward for the Brobeck Flager law firm headlocked the DA center and wrestled him to the floor. They scrabbled while the referees stood by, impotently blowing their whistles. O'Brien jumped in, yanking the Brobeck player from his fallen teammate. Still on his knees, the man wrenched himself free of O'Brien's hold and pushed him back. He rose to his feet and clenched his fists. You assholes do nothing but foul, the big forward said, his fists ready. You're the worst cheaters in the league. Who made you ref, dickwad? O'Brien said, clenching his fists. You swing at me, I'm taking you down. Michael, back away, Gamble urged. In his mid-thirties, coy about his age, Gamble was a fourth-generation patrician who looked like a strip club bouncer his broad shoulders and chest heavily muscled from too much time in the gym. He was neither as tall nor as well-read as he claimed, but he did stand by his friends. Both you guys back away. Go ahead and try, asshole, the belligerent forward said, ignoring Gamble and stepping forward. Take your best shot, O'Brien said, grim, dancing lightly on the balls of his feet to his right, eyeing the bigger man. Don't do it, no, no, no. Gamble shouted. The forward cocked his right fist just below his chin, seemingly ready to strike. But before he could, O'Brien punched him hard on the nose. O'Brien's second and third blow struck home as well, and the dazed forward crumpled to the floor. A shaking O'Brien stood over him and glowered at the rest of the Brobeck team, demanding, Anyone else want to go? One referee shouted, You're out of the game! The young women on the sideline studied O'Brien as the two teams barked at one another from either side of the downed player. The boulder exchanged expletives and war cries, trusting they'd be held back by their teammates. But lawyers being lawyers, the physical threats and insults soon devolved into technical claims of game forfeiture and aggravated assault. Damn it all, what the hell were you thinking, Flippa? Gamble demanded, using O'Brien's boyhood nickname to soften his words. Secretly, he was impressed. He'd known O'Brien had a temper. It had erupted in earlier games, but he had no idea his protege was so lethal. He glanced from the big man on the floor, still dazed, back to O'Brien and shook his head. I had to protect Romani, O'Brien said, indicating the DA team's center 
who had by now joined the Drummond staff on the sideline. O'Brien's Boston accent was flaring in excitement. He flexed his right hand, inspecting it for damage, rubbing his knuckles. Romani's half again your size, he could protect himself. I'm suing your ass, number 16, the forward said, sitting up, working his jaw with both hands. I'm gonna sue you for assault and battery. Take every penny you've got. Every penny I've got is in my fucking wallet. Good luck collecting a dime, O'Brien said. Apologize, Gamble urged under his breath. The two men had become friends after O'Brien had taken Gamble's legal research and writing class in law school. But Gamble was ten years O'Brien's senior and often treated him like a wayward charge, hectoring him to little effect. Do it right now. There's a small chance you can make this better. I'm quite sure his legal threat isn't a bluff. No way! You saw what he did to Romani. It was self-defense. Romani might have claimed self-defense. You can't. Don't go professor on me. That prick was following us all game. I should have gotten a couple more shots in. Besides, he was going to hit me first. I just beat him to it. Gamble sighed, questioning whether he had any obligation to report this incident, whether a couple of punches thrown in a middle school gym amounted to anything at all. The referees restored order by ejecting both the Ford and O'Brien and declaring that the game would be decided by free throws. As it happened, both sides missed their shots. Each declared itself the winner by default, and the game fizzled out, muttered curses trailing the teams into the evening fog. Where'd you learn to punch like that, Flip? That was quite a combination, Jerry Romani said, handing O'Brien the pitcher of beer, his neck still chafed from the headlock. They sat with half the team and several secretaries at a long, boat-varnished table at the Plow and the Stars, a new Irish pub on Clement Street in the Inner Richmond District. Like the Sunset District, its poorer stepsister across Golden Gate Park, the Richmond was a working-class neighborhood slowly squeezing out its longtime residents. The lively pub had a pool table, a couple dartboards, mirrors overlaid with the word Guinness, sentimental pictures of the Emerald Isle, and a low riser for live music. I went to a Catholic school. You either learned how to fight at Sacred Heart or got stomped every day at lunch, O'Brien said. You punch way better than that. Romani knew street brawling. He'd been an investigator for the DA's office for 20 years before taking an early retirement and a new job as a detective in Sausalito, a Tony tourist-ridden enclave just across the Golden Gate Bridge. Box the little golden gloves, O'Brien said. My mother signed me up to keep me out of trouble. Did okay. Now you simply must learn to control that temper of yours, Gamble said, sipping the house Chardonnay. He had an exaggerated posh accent sounding English to less traveled ears. It amused his friends and gave his detractors a foothold for complaining about him. Adults do not get into fights, period. Besides, if you hadn't stunned him with that first punch, that chap might have taken your head off. He's as big as Jerry. That's why I threw it. The first punch always wins. He's right. On the street, that's Bible, Romani said, gulping his beer. That never throw the first punch advice is a load of crap turn the other cheek and get your ass kicked. Anyway, I owe you, kid. Thanks for pulling him off me. You'll owe me too, Flipper, as soon as I figure out how to bury this, said Gamble, drumming his thick fingers on the table, pursing his lips. An hour after the event, he'd had time to consider whether the contretemps might have any effect on him. Bury what? Last time I read the penal code, assault and battery was still a misdemeanor, and aggravated A and B's a felony. Jesus H., it was no big deal, O'Brien said, studying his throbbing knuckles, rolling his fingers. It'll be forgotten in a week. But I really did pop him pretty good, didn't I? He laughed, flashing a grin at the brunette who made a determined effort to sit near him. Encouraged, she drew her chair closer. But then O'Brien remembered he had a date. He stood, pulled a twenty from his wallet, and tossed it on the table, playfully squeezing Gamble's broad shoulders. I've got to go, he said, addressing the table. This'll cover my share in Jiminy Crickets here, too. I want to be there the day Blake finally picks up a tab. The church will call it a miracle. Can't you stay? Gamble pleaded. Nah, I got a commitment. See you at next week's game.
If I can get you a pardon from the governor, Gamble grumbled.